Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, you know, when we first started talking about this idea what, six, seven, eight months ago, maybe even longer, um, I, uh, I was quite excited, very excited about the possibility of of us actually reflecting on where we've been and where we hopefully are going. Uh, the Sikh journey, I think, in Canada is a very fascinating one, a very intriguing one, and one that's filled with a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges, but a lot of progress. I can, being a Sikh Canadian, I can very, very confidently say that I am sure that it's the spirit of the Sikh people and the Punjabi people that will ensure that 100 years from today there will be people talking about 200 years ago and the great Canadian experience of the Sikh community. But with mass migration there's also a lot of challenges now. I mean something that I've noticed in my own lifetime is, is when I was born and in, in 1980, and then when we were growing up, we, had, we still had this underlying urge to make sure that everybody fit in, everybody uh, became more Canadian than they were Indo-Canadian, but still always maintained their religious <coughs> heritage. And there's a big dis distinction between that. There's a big distinction between uh, the cultural components of being Indian and being uh, maintaining your religious heritage of being a Sikh. One of the challenges I, I foresee now for us moving forth is as, as a greater number of community members settle, and this is true for every single community, how do we ensure that people still feel the need to pick up what's great about Canadian culture and leave some components of Indo-Canadian culture or Indian culture behind? And I and I bring this up because right after this, I'm going to I'm going to a workshop uh, that I helped fund uh, while I was a minister of, of human services put on by, the, uh, by a new organization called Punjabi Community Health Services. And this specific organization, I'm hoping, will devote a lot of time to break, breaking down a lot of, a lot of the, the systemic barriers, especially when it comes to gender inequality and when it comes to um, the, the difficulty people find about speaking up on social issues. Social issues like, for example, I'll give you an example, uh, we started a campaign to talk about issues like child sexual abuse within the community. It happens in every single community, but talking about these types of things rattles people like nothing else. And so the moment you start talking about it, the establishment leadership says, well, why would you talk about it in our community? It makes it look like it's a problem. I said, well, unless you're immune, unless, unless you're the one people in the entire world that's immune from this problem, it is a problem. And so that, I feel, is going to be the battle of the next hundred years, is challenging those types of social norms uh, around difficult issues that prevent us from talking about difficult issues. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, everybody would have said, those aren't issues for us, they are issues for the mainstream. It doesn't happen in our community. And what I'm here to say now is they happen, and those will be the most significant issues the Sikh community faces moving forth. The, the progress, and I'm not saying that they happen more than any other community, I'm just saying that they can't be ignored anymore. That's, that's my argument. The progress of a community, once it's overcome a lot of the, the external challenges that you face, like, you know, we face... We face incredible external challenges here in the city of Calgary, trying to build the Northeast Cordura. Incredible challenges. Uh, issues of, of community associations saying, no, you can't build it. People coming up with all sorts of reasons why. I mean, in 1989, the Gurdwara was built after years of struggle with, within the city. 
So once I feel you sort of overcome some of those overt issues of, of bias, you have to get to the core, the internal issues that, that affect the community. And on the subject of, of external issues of bias, uh, let's be very clear, external issues of bias have not gone away. Uh, Canadian society has become a lot more open and inclusive and diversive. <coughs> diverse. There's no question about that. But external issues of bias have not completely gone away. And the new generation of external issues of bias will, will be not just of the majority and the minority, but they will be amongst the minorities, in my opinion. The new biases that I'm starting to see are, are amongst minorities. And I think, you know, I, I think that's a very significant challenge for Canadian society overall. We are no stronger in our diversity unless we integrate. Canada as a nation is no stronger in its diversity unless people integrate. Unless people have an idea of who their neighbor is and accept them for everything they are. This too, this too will be the new, the new uh, challenge of, of the social fabric of Canada. And I, I think a lot of people are very afraid to have that particular discussion. But uh, when it comes to when it comes to diversity and integration, uh, I think uh, that will be a major issue that we must proactively address in Canada to make sure that, especially newcomers, have the ability to integrate very quickly so people don't feel excluded, people don't live in isolation, and so that you actually take advantage of the diversity you have as a nation. So, uh, that's me pretending I'm a professor, I'm a politician, but, uh, but every once in a while we have to pretend that we, we know what we're talking about. It doesn't happen often in politics, but it does happen. Um, so uh, I just want to I just want to say um, thank you very much for to Michael and the entire team. And and here at Mount Royal, I've taken many classes at Mount Royal. I have a, a hope that one day we'll have a, a center for Canadian Sikh studies here at Mount Royal. Uh, that's. Uh, That, that's sort of been something that, that, I, that uh, I, Michael and I have talked about for a while, and I'm speaking now not as a government minister, but as a member of the community. I should make that very clear. But it's not a, it's not a promise, Sharon Paul. Okay? This isn't a promise. This isn't a minister saying... Make me a promise. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is just something I think that needs, needs to happen, needs to take place. And, I, you know, I'm going to finish off on one more thing. Uh, I don't know if anybody has, has discussed this, but I find that the most brilliant part of, of the Canadian story is uh, we're talking about the Tamagata Maru. hundred years later, you know, one of the regiments that turned the, the Tamagata Maru away was the BC Regiment. And you know who the commander of the BC Regiment today is? It's a Sikh Canadian named Hadid Singh Sajjan. And he's he's a very he's he's a decorated Canadian soldier. He he's been awarded the highest honor in the forces, the Order, order of Merit uh, of Military Merit. He's been ordered the <laughs> given the highest honor. And I know we have a, an American or two in the crowd. So while the USA still has debates on whether or not a man in a turban can serve in armed conflict. In the American forces, the American forces wrote to the Canadians asking for Harjit Sajjan to go on two additional tours in Afghanistan to serve as a special advisor to the American generals in Afghanistan. So they're, they're not sure if they want the turban in their own forces, but they're sure as hell sure that they want Harjit Sajjan to come and advise them. That's, uh, according to, to my knowledge, that's the only time in Canadian history that the Americans have requested a specific Canadian soldier. They didn't say, hey, give us, give us a, a regiment. They said, give us this one guy. Give us this one guy. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful story of what happens a hundred years later. So, 
Enjoy the rest of your, uh, of your seminar. Thank you very much.